Hey, this is Web3 Talks. The rule of this podcast is simple. We only talk with people who have hands-on Web3 building experience. So if you are a hacker, entrepreneur, or investor, you can get inspired by their stories, lessons, and fuck-ups. My name is Mac, and I'm hosting this pod. If you want to stay in touch, go to twitter.com slash webfreetalks, click the link in the pinned tweet, and join our Discord community. Let's go. Today's guest is Anton Bernstein, CEO and co-founder of HiRise. And HiRise is a mobile app that lets users create avatars, chat, hang around in different digital places, trade collectibles, and so on. It's like, like in my words, it's like an isometric RPG game, but without like a main plot that you need to follow. And the app launched in 2014, and it was long before Metaverse World has been so popular. And since then, it got over 16 million downloads. And like, I'm not a big Metaverse fan, but I tried the app and I understood why people can get hooked. So we'll talk about it a lot. But before we go deeper into high rise, Anton, could you tell us how did you get into Web3 World? Because as far as I understand, in 2014, you created this app without any like NFT slash crypto related ideas. Yeah, sure. So just um, quick background is in 2014, we started a company called Pocket Worlds. In 2016, we launched High Rise. In 2020, we actually acquired another business called Everskies, which is also another avatar based community. On High Rise, we have north of 2 million monthly active users, north of 20 million installs. On Everskies, we now have north of 4 million registered users and north of 1 million monthly active users. And uh, both of them are very much social communities built around avatars, people connecting through avatars. They're kind of what we would consider to be at the intersection of social networking and gaming. And a lot of it is very heavily UGC. So a lot of the content that you see on HiRise and Everskies is created by the users. And especially a lot of the experiences are created by the users. In terms of Web3, I've personally been involved in blockchain since 2013. That's when I first bought Bitcoin. In 2018, we actually launched an NFT project. This was like back when OpenSea was literally just starting out. So I was meeting mm-hmm. with those guys in the Airbnb lobby to talk to them about how we can get on OpenSea and all this stuff. And this was obviously on Ethereum mainnet because that's really all there was at the time. And we realized then that the infrastructure and the technology was just too early. We did end up building the project. We actually ended up getting quite a bit of transaction volume on it, but it was totally on the side and it wasn't part of high rise and it wasn't part of Eversky's. And so more recently, about a year, year and a half ago, that's when we started to really invest in building on Web3 because we started to see some interesting technologies out there like, you know, new layer ones, you know, some interesting layer two solutions. We ended up launching an NFT collection on Immutable X which is a layer two solution on top of Ethereum, you know, secured by Ethereum, a ZK rollup. Right now we're working on Avalanche. We're building our own subnet that we call the high-rise blockchain. But all of that is to say the reason why we, you know, I've been pretty excited about building in Web3 and the reason why we're building on Web3 now is because I think it's the right tool to build a digital economy. So we have a very active, very vibrant digital economy, both in high-rise and ever skies. Just in high-rise alone, we have about a hundred million dollars in annual transaction volume, you know, transacted between our users and players. And that's all without leveraging the composable permissionless money infrastructure that blockchain enables. And so we're pretty excited to, if we can solve the UX questions, you know, make it really easy for our users to be able to actually use blockchain to be able to integrate this kind of composable permissionless money, because then essentially enables liquidity for our currency and for our token, which Again, we already have a currency. It's called gold and high rise. It's called stars and never skies, but it is not exchange traded. It is not composable. It is not permissionless. People can't build applications on top of it, et cetera. And so, you know, I do believe that if you have a digital economy, then the right tool for the job is on chain data. So that's kind of why we decided to get into it about a year, year and a half ago. Yeah, you know, that's why, although I'm very reluctant to talk about metaverse projects here because most of them are very shallow like you know there's a lot of marketing but there are no users at all 
But in your case, I see like it's the other way around. Like you already have millions of users, the numbers that many metaverse projects would kill for. And you do this transition now, like you do it like the right way, I guess. And, you know, I use the app. I actually downloaded the app. I made my avatar. I walk around because that's what I do with every guest. I want to try the product to have some deeper understanding. And like, I get uh, intrigued about it because first of all, like, I don't care about like my digital avatars, but when I created it, I already like, oh yeah, that's my avatar. And so I already got hooked. Like I felt the sense of ownership. And I talked with some people that like, you don't know whether, you know, whether they are girls or or boys or like men or women, because like, you have no idea these are just avatars. But I got into some conversations. I went to some club and so on. And I was intrigued because I was wondering like, who's the target audience for that? I felt that most people there were younger than me, I guess around 20, maybe younger, but I'm not sure. Because I've heard some people talking about parents' credit cards to, <laughs> to buy some stuff online. But I wonder, like, who's like the typical user of both of these apps? Yeah. So when it comes to high rise, high rise, our average age is 20. And 70 to 75% of our audience is female. It's mm-hmm. very global. About 20 to 25% is in the US, but we have big communities in uh, really all over the world Brazil, Russia, Ukraine, the Middle East. We're one of the top apps in Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Of course, all the English-speaking countries like Australia, UK, etc. But yeah, it tends to be a female who's around 20. Maybe she's aged out of Roblox. So maybe Roblox is too young for her now. Maybe she's looking for a place where she can be really expressive and really creative while still being very, very social. Maybe she's really interested in collectability. So she loves to collect toys or she loves to collect clothing. Fashion is a really big orientation for for high-rise. Or maybe she likes to likes to play games and uh, kind of is interested in playing some games that are deeply social by design. So our games are very, very social. They're real time. Mm-hmm. So usually there's somebody who's hosting the game. They're hosting an experience. So for example, a game might be a pageant where somebody says dress in red and then everybody dresses in red and then they give the winner some sort of prize. Usually it's a currency. Usually it's our goal. Mm-hmm. Once we start introducing our token, then you know we think or hope that they'll start giving the token as the prize. As we add more mechanics there, you know, mm-hmm. there will be more mechanics in which you can earn the token mm-hmm. from other community members. Everskies is a little bit younger. Everskies is more teenage. It's still 70 to 75% female, still very much focused on dress up and self-expression, but yeah, a little bit younger on that teenage side. Yeah, so like if you merge this metaverse of yours with classic crypto metaverse, I guess you would have like 50-50% men and women because, you know, it will even out. So like, you know, I was wondering because I remember that in 2002, so it was like 20 years ago, I visited my friend who was internet geek. And, you know, we sat in front of this like big gray CRT monitor and he has shown me some avatar chat. It was 2D. Like, obviously, it was pretty basic, but it was there. It's not a new idea. It was there, but it it didn't really catch on. Like, most people moved to IRC or, like, classic chat rooms back then. And I'm wondering, what do you think have changed since then? Why do you think right now people might really get into this idea of avatar chats? Yeah. First of all, I think it goes beyond avatar chat. It's more about interactive and immersive environments and experiences. So right now, you know, if you think about kind of a static chat room or a static chat environment, it's literally just two people kind of communicating back and forth. There aren't many dimensions or many vectors by which you can express yourself or, you know, actually connect or talk to someone. I also remember that in the mid to late 2000s, virtual worlds were a rage, right? I don't know if you remember Second Life, but kind of in the mid 2000s, Second Life was really in the popular consciousness. Mm -hmm. Everyone was talking about it and actually really reminds me of Sandbox today. Second Life actually had a lot more users than Sandbox does and was never as valuable as Sandbox. But, you know, I went to Gotham Hall for NFT NYC where Sandbox had a three-day event and they were highlighting all of their partnerships. And I was talking to somebody and he was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure Sandbox is really going to succeed because look at all the partnerships that they have. And I was just thinking about Second Life and like how Gap was opening stores in Second Life and Ferrari was opening dealerships in Second Life. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it still ended up being a niche and it still ended up kind of being a 
something that is still a very good business, actually. I think Second Life does something like 50 million a year in revenue or so today to this day, but it's still a small business, right? It never grew to the scale that people had hoped that it would be like Facebook level, you know, hundreds of millions of users, et cetera. And so I think one, gaming has become a lot more ubiquitous. You know, I don't think that in the mid to late 2000s, even we would have believed if somebody told you that Fortnite could have existed, this game that, you know, hundreds of millions of people ended up playing that was a battle royale, that was a first person shooter. I don't think most people would have believed you. I, I think it, 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 gaming just wasn't that big and, and people don't remember that. But that's true. Gaming has grown at like a 10% a year clip for 20 years. That's massive growth. So that's, I think, one. Two is I think people are growing up gaming uh, a lot more and with a lot more accessibility. Roblox, I think, is, has actually played a big role in this and Minecraft, both of them. And so people have gotten a little bit habituated to that user experience, uh, a more immersive, more interactive world, Like especially if you look at people, again, high rise, average age 20. We have a lot of people between the ages of 20 and 30 who are looking to kind of interact and express themselves that way. And then the third piece, I think, and this speaks more to our strategy around how we're growing high rise and high rise world. So the way that I think about it is platforms like Second Life, like Sandbox, like Rec Room, like Roblox, et cetera. The way that they partition their communities, the way that those businesses are kind of set up functions in a way such that it creates one monoculture or one subculture inside of those products. So Roblox is for nine to 13 year olds. Rec Room is kind of for nine to 13 year olds. Dude, Second Life mm-hmm. is people who are looking to really escape the world. Etc. Sandbox is going to be, I don't know, for like crypto enthusiasts, but it ends up creating this, these kinds of uh, niches and these kinds of subcultures. And the alternative strategy, which is the strategy that we're starting to employ, looks more like Discord. Mm-hmm. And I think what's really interesting about Discord and the way that Discord partitions their communities is you don't join Discord, you join a particular Discord. The analogy I would give is, let's say everyone joined the same Discord. It just wouldn't make sense. And that's the way that Second Life is and Sandbox Mm -hmm. is and Rec Room is and Roblox is. Everybody is joining the same Discord. And if everybody joined the same Discord, the Discord would adapt to one subculture or one culture. And then it wouldn't appeal to 99% of people. It would appeal to the 1% that are really interested in that particular culture. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing now is we're introducing this concept called the high-rise world, where any community or any brand or any IP can actually build their own high-rise. And it's partitioned in such a way that the high rise itself is a collection of infinite experiences built by either the community owner or their fandom. And that's where they interact with this particular community. And so when we think about getting from 3 million monthly active users, which is where we are now, now, if you include high rise never spend, to 300 million monthly active users or 3 billion monthly active users, I think that the way to do that is this kind of partitioned Discord approach where every community that is interested in building something more interactive, more virtual, can actually launch their own high rise. It makes perfect sense to me as, you know, I'm a big fan of Andrew Chan's cold start problem. He repeats, like, start with atomic networks, like small, as you said, like subcultures that you can just connect after that. But you need people who have a lot in common so that it can grow faster. So I think it makes perfect, perfect sense. Yeah, so that it can grow faster and also so that the people who don't have something in yeah. common don't end up quitting. They have an option to, to, to exit yeah. and just like choose the place that they like. Yeah, exactly. Because I think our high-rise, for example, so we're rebranding our high-rise to what we call high-rise 101, which is just another high-rise in the high-rise world. I don't think it would be appealing to you. I don't think it's a place where you would maybe spend a lot of time. But, you know, I'm wearing a Doodles shirt right now. Maybe Doodles has a high rise. Mm -hmm. Uh, And maybe that's a place that's appealing to you. Maybe the events that they throw, the AMAs that they throw, Mm -hmm. the games that maybe they construct or their fandom constructs, maybe that would be appealing to you. Or maybe there's some other community that you would want to be a part of Mm -hmm. that is not necessarily our community, which is so focused on dress up and so focused on kind of creativity and self-expression, mostly for girls. Okay. And like, you know, right now, as you said, you have over 2 million monthly active users. And I'm wondering... You know, how have you acquired the first ones? Because like Chad is like, it's like basically chicken egg problem. Like you need people to bring more people in. So I'm wondering how have you done it? So actually, so we were bootstrapped for the first five years of our company. We did end up raising about $10 million. We went through YC, we we did some stuff there. And we actually haven't spent any of it because we've been profitable this whole time. Mm. But we were bootstrapped for the first five. 
And that means we, we did a lot of struggling. We were like a four person company for, I don't know, four years. We ended up launching two products in the beginning. So we started the company in about 2014. We launched this product called Pockets in 2014, 2015, another one called Harvest Crossing in 2015 or so. Both of them were MMOs on mobile because our core thesis was we should bring multiplayer gaming and multiplayer social kind of game-like experiences to mobile because that's the new platform. If you remember, the iPhone came out in 2009. So 2010, 2011 was when people were starting to kind of innovate and build on mobile. And even 2012, 2013, 2014, there weren't really multiplayer games on mobile. Not a ton of social networking. Instagram was just taking off. And so that's where, where we started to explore. The first two products we launched, Pockets and Harvest Crossing, we acquired users from them directly. So we ran paid ads on Facebook to try to attract users. What we discovered actually with Pockets was the metrics actually weren't that bad. We actually had reasonably strong day one, day seven, day 30 retention. And we just thought it wasn't very good. We thought we could do better. And so we ended up shutting Pockets down, launching Harvest Crossing, which was a, a farming genre MMO. Again, we did some paid acquisition mm -hmm. to try to drive traffic to Harvest Crossing and realized and actually, the Pockets metrics were pretty good because the Harvest Crossing metrics were terrible. And so, <laughs> uh, and so we quickly shut down Harvest Crossing. And then we launched High Rise, which was the next evolution of Pockets. It had a different avatar system, and it was a lot more focused on UGC. So whereas Pockets was more of a world that we constructed, High Rise was much more focused on a world that our users constructed, giving them the tools to be able to build that world. And when we launched in 2016, Roblox actually wasn't really on the map yet. I'm not even sure that I had tried out or played Roblox at that time. Maybe I did, um, just because I was I always surveying the landscape. But certainly it wasn't massively popular like it is today, or at least massively known, although it was consistently growing. And so we launched High Rise, and then the first you know 100,000 users, we really we ran paid acquisition to drive those users to join High Rise. What we ended up seeing was that our retention is, is kind of interesting, and I think this is the case with many subcultures, like subculture type products, is we have a big top funnel. It's actually quite easy for us to attract users at the top funnel. And then many of them end up churning. Many, many of them end up not retaining. But the ones that do, you know, the 5 to 10% that end up retaining, end up retaining for a very, very long time because they find their community, they find their people, they find their friends, and they end up sticking around for a very long time. And they end up kind of participating in our economy and purchasing and actually driving a lot of lifetime value for the product over a long period of time. And so one lesson that I kind of learned there is, I mean, what's really, really important is does your retention curve flatten out or does it, you know, is it, is it kind of vertical? Does it go to zero? And as long as it flattens out, you can build a sustainable business out of 1% retention, 5% retention, 30% retention. All of those can support sustainable businesses, obviously, depending on how much your customers spend. But as long as the curve doesn't go to zero or it goes to zero over a you know, four-year time horizon, then you have a sustainable business. And this was really contrary, especially at the time, to what people were saying. Everyone was saying, oh, you got to hit day 30, you know, 10%, 15% retention in order to build a sustainable business. And that's just not the advice that I would give to founders. The advice I would give to founders is what does your slope look like? You know, is your day 14 over day seven or day 30 over day seven, is that close to one? Because if you can get that number close to one, then all of a sudden your slope, your retention slope can extend for a really, really long time. And as long as it can extend for a really long time and those customers continue to spend money with you, you can build a really sustainable business. Mm -hmm. So that's what we saw with, with High Rise. We saw that the slope was, you know, even though it, it kind of dropped precipitously in the beginning, then it really flattened out and people really stuck around. And so today, you know, 2022, we have tons of users from 2016, 2017 who are still, you know, very much engaged in the app. They're popular in the app. They have followers because we have a news feed. They've kind of built a following, built an audience, and they've kind of built a presence there. So anyway, that was just kind of like a bit of advice for any builders who are listening. Yeah, it's very interesting because it's uh, counterintuitive. As you said, like this, you know, most people think you need to have like 10, 15 percent retention, and it turns out you don't. And as your business is profitable, just like, unlike most of the apps, I think it's worth to listen to what you have said. But you know, I'm wondering, like, have you managed to find out who were these five percent of users that stuck? Yeah, I mean, we have a pretty good idea of who they are. I mean, just in terms of like 
personality and character profile. We actually used a, a third party tool to do like psychographic analysis on our users, um, on our audiences. We, you know, we get a lot of data from them. We're also very close to our users. In fact, our company, so our company today, we're about 90 people, almost 100 people. I think about 10% of our company is actually former users. So it's people who, in fact, our head of product was a former user, or I think three, three people in live ops come from the community, one or two people from QA, one or two people from support. Um, we have a few artists. Our community also designs content for the app. And so we actually learn a lot by hiring from our community. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a, like a really effective way for us to build for our community. And so, and so, yeah, you know, we've, we've kind of learned a lot about them. And like I said, it's, it's usually women. It's not necessarily people in like the biggest cities, right? It's people maybe out in the suburbs or, or kind of like out there a little bit. It's people who are, they're not necessarily looking for a pure escape. You know, we have a news feed. A lot of people post their photos, photos of themselves, who they are, but they are looking for an alternative social network that is not their real life network, right? They're looking for pseudo anonymity. They're not looking for pure anonymity and they're not looking for kind of like a, to get connected to all their, you know, high school mm -hmm. friends or whatever, or college friends, but they are looking for this kind of pseudo anonymous place. And they're really into dress up, really into self-expression and really into collecting collecting virtual goods, collecting virtual content. In fact, the reason why Web3 is such a good fit for them and kind of the NFT community is such a good fit is because they were collecting before NFTs were a thing. And when we first launched NFTs and, and Web3 into our community, we got a bit of pushback, right? A lot of, I think, artists and gamers tend to push back on, on NFTs, at least used to. I'm hearing less and less of that now, but mm -hmm. at the time there was a big pushback. And I understand where they're coming from. We can talk more about that too. But I will say one of my messages to them that I think resonated was, look, you guys are pioneers in this space. You've been collecting digital goods before Post Malone decided to get a board aid, or Jimmy Kimmel decided to get a board aid. You guys have been doing this for forever. You've appreciated the value, despite the fact that maybe people around you, like your family or friends, are like, why are you buying this, you know, quote unquote, stupid digital shirt? And it's like, well, because I appreciate the value of that this shirt gives me, maybe it gives me status in this world. I spend time in this world. This is where I have friends. You know, there's all these reasons why you might want to present yourself in a certain way or present your status in a certain way in digital space. I would say NFTs, they allow you to present that status across the entire internet because it's open and permissionless. So, you know, I can get this doodles NFT and put it as my Twitter profile, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of your, your status across the entire internet mm -hmm. for our users. You know, there's a lot of status games that they're playing inside of high rise. And so inside of high rise, if you have those assets, they mean something. Increasingly, now that we all have been integrating NFTs mm -hmm. and have been integrating blockchain, those high rise assets are starting to mean something both inside high rise and outside high rise, and kind of like expanding your status a little bit. It's very interesting to listen to that. I really like the way that you shown your users why NFTs might be a good fit for them, because that's what you said. And like, the impression I got when I started learning about high rise because I haven't heard about it before, that you've done many things that web free projects now want to do, but you've done them before yeah. without blockchain, of course, but like you've done it and your POC says, okay, it works. Maybe not for like 3 billion users yet, but at least for a few million. And it's, it's enough. It's enough to just, you know, expand and invest into that. I'll tell you what, one thing that's that's really interesting. So in November, we launched this NFT collection called the High Rise Creature Club on Immutable X. It is a collection of 11,111 outfits that look like creatures. You can wear the individual traits or you can wear the entire outfit in High Rise. So you buy them through the web portal. We use the launch pad. So you buy them through the launch pad. You connect your MetaMask on our website, highrise.game. And then that is then displayed in our application, mm -hmm. uh, the High Rise iOS app or Android app. And actually we're launching a website, a web app next month. And the sale did really well. We sold out in 30 seconds. We did about two to 3 million in primary sales, about almost 10 million in secondary sales, just on that 11,111 collection. We're a top five collection on Immutable X. And I'll say our users are actually going through quite a bit of UX hurdles to continue to buy, sell, trade mm -hmm. these creatures. Because to use Immutable X, you need to have MetaMask, then you need to be able to bridge over, you know, create an Immutable X wallet, then bridge your ETH over to Immutable X, and then use a third-party exchange like Token Trove or the Immutable X marketplace to buy and sell the creatures. And yet our users are doing it, right? So they're going over 
kind of these massive UX hurdles to go and participate in the economy of the high-rise future club. And so what happens when we launch our Avalanche subnet, where the gas token is actually our token, and we provide the marketplace, and we give you a wallet so that you don't need to set up MetaMask. Mm -hmm. And we kind of solve all of your UX questions and UX problems. We give you the fiat on ramp with like MoonPay or ramp. And all of a sudden, all you have to do is make a high rise account and you can buy, sell, trade the creatures or any other NFTs that we launch using our marketplace with very little hurdles in the way. I would expect transaction volume to be significantly higher. And so I'm pretty excited about that, given kind of what you said, the POC is indicating that there's quite a bit of demand and, and kind of like willingness to participate, despite pretty massive user experience hurdles. Mm -hmm. You know, some people might say, you know, some metaverse skeptics that I like identified with before I used high rise and learned more and experience more was that, you know, you could say, okay, but like these people create this alternative digital identities. They spend money on things that are not real in a way that they are not physical. But, you know, like the thing is, you say that your app is like, you know, 70% women. So like why men can after work become warlocks or like, you know, uh, witchers or like whatever and do something that is not real and they can just relax by being someone else so the same with like also like women and also men that use high rise like they can become someone else but not in a way that they play some game with a plot or they you know play world of warcraft they play like a social game because it is like a social game but they play social game as someone else and and i think it, it's okay because like, you know, when I created my avatar, I didn't make it look like me because I was like, yeah, like, let's try being someone else. And it was interesting. And it was also pretty re relaxing because like, if you are someone else, just like when you play RPG game, whether it's like, you know, a classical game where, where you have like a game master or, or whether it's like on computer, you can just like detach from all your problems and like everything that you have on everyday basis. And I, and actually like, you know, this like, I don't know, an hour that I spent on high rise convinced me that metaverse can be a thing for more people than I thought. Yes, I totally agree. I don't, I don't know if you've ever been to Burning Man, Yeah, but I've gone to Burning Man every year since 2013. I have a camp, our friends and I. And to me, that is the closest kind of real life analog to what is possible, I think, if the metaverse is fully realized, because it's a place where there's no judgment. You're very much focused on self-expression, right? It, it's all about like, how can you maximally express yourself in this kind of place? It's highly interactive and the interactivity is very bizarre, right? Like there's lots of strange and different and unique interactions that you can have. I think that the feeling, in my opinion, the feeling that most people feel at Burning Man that is so refreshing and the reason why they like it so much is this feeling of freedom. It's like a feeling of kind of mental freedom social freedom, psychological freedom, where you don't feel like you're kind of destined to be who you are. You don't feel like pressured to be a certain way by society or whatever. And so kind of the, in virtual space, you can be who you want. You can experiment, you can be creative. You don't have to be kind of like shackled by maybe your genetics or by what your parents think of you or whatever. And so I think that that is a very liberating experience. I think some virtual spaces can develop a toxic culture. I will say that. And I think it's important to be cognizant and aware of that and try to mitigate that to the degree that that's possible. We actually have a 20 person support and trust and safety team focused on kind of ensuring that our spaces are safe, things like that. And I think kind of to my point earlier, I think different spaces will just have different cultures and you need to partition the kind of the metaverse or the metaverse space in such a way that you can support those many different cultures instead of everyone feeling pressured to be kind of one way. Then it starts to become a lot more like real life. You got to like follow the rules of society. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important thing. Adding to your thing about Burning Man, like for people who haven't participated, like yeah. some people even invented their new names, like playa names. So you can literally become someone else. And, you know, I I'm wondering, like, how have you solved one of the biggest engagement problems, which is making user generated content, because, you know, I know that you have like lots of 
user generated content there and and most of the transactions are are based on that so i'm wondering like how have you made it happen so there's actually two different approaches between high rise and never skies today i'll start with high rise high rise the content is actually produced by our artists mostly we have 20 artists almost in house and they produce most of the content that being said there are two things that happen on high rise and a few that we're evolving to focus more and more on ugc so one is at least once a month, sometimes more, we run what's what we call a user design contest. And we have our own tooling that we have built where people submit ideas, submit drawings, et cetera. And then other people end up voting on them. We have a whole kind of like multi-phase process. The winners end up getting selected. And then our artists produce the content. So you could literally sketch something on the back of a napkin and have it be produced in high res. And then you end up winning a prize that's in-game. So you end up winning in-game currency and you end up winning some in-game items. If you win that contest several times, then you get up enrolled into what we call the high rise brands program, which means you have direct access to our artists. You produce content maybe once a month, something like that. Maybe you, you're kind of, you know how to produce content a little bit better. We give you a bunch of resources and training and materials to learn how to produce really kind of relevant art for high rise. And then when we release your content, we give you a rev share. And right now our high rise brands artists, they make about 5,000 bucks a collection, which is pretty good. It's like two to three weeks of part-time work for you know somebody to, to to make some money. But we want to increase that number a lot. And Web3 actually plays a big role in that once we start kind of uh, integrating both NFTs and our tokens um, for payment methods. And by the way, the experiences themselves, like the rooms and the environments, like where people hang out, 99.9% .9 of that is user-generated. We just do occasional events. We run events every week. There's like a custom room for that. But otherwise, it's pretty much all user generated. In Everskies, we actually don't even have an art team. The Everskies team is actually pretty small. And all of the content, every single piece of content is designed by users. And they all make revenue from releasing that content and other people buying them. And so we have almost 300,000 items now on Everskies. And they're produced by, by our users. And Everskies only launched a year and a half, maybe almost two years ago, I think about a year and a half ago. And yet it's, it's growing so, so fast. I think we just broke 175,000 daily active users we're going to hit 200,000 daily active users very, very soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, I think I attribute a lot of that actually to the UGC. Because our users are creating all the content, the top content is really, really good. It's really, really appealing. And so if you just go to like Pinterest.com and you search virtual dress up or virtual fashion, Everskies will actually be most of the content. <laughs> Or if you go to TikTok and look up Everskies, you'll see it's extremely popular. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is just because, you know, in general, users know what they want. And the top 0.1% of users are usually extremely talented and produce really good content. So we're leaning more and more heavily into being a platform where our users create mm -hmm. the vast majority of the content. And on HiRise, we're actually building out a whole separate map editor and a whole separate avatar editor where our users can create all the content mm -hmm. and we'll just help them release it, help them merchandise it and kind of get it sold. It adds this, you know, new use case like whenever i'm a user and i think i'm talented or or i might put a lot of hard work into that like you can become someone in this world like you know people can just use your stuff and i think it's very rewarding like even if we put aside the financial rewards like it's like it gives you some status and you become like a, a person like you're like a you know fashion designer like, you know yeah Totally. It's both. I have a friend who she makes content for Second Life primarily, but has also been getting into some other worlds. She has become very financially independent because of the content she produces. I mean, she makes millions of dollars a year. It's incredible. And this is all provided by the fact that this platform exists and shares quite a bit of rev share with the creators. And that's definitely what we aspire to be for both High Rise and Never Skies. We want people to be able to make a living, have a business, have a small business where they can sell that content. And I think what's really mm -hmm. special about doing that in virtual space is there's no middleman between the customer, except us. There's no middleman between the customer and the end user. And so you end up getting kind of this direct wealth redistribution. Mm -hmm. Because when I think about like a pair of Nikes, right? Like the, the factory worker who's making the Nikes in the Philippines or Cambodia or wherever they make their content, you know, they're making very, very little, you know, dollars. And most of the revenue actually goes to the transportation and the brand and the retailer and the merchandiser and all this stuff, right? And so in digital space, you don't have any of that. You just have the creator and you have the consumer and then you have the platform. We're the platform. We are trying to take less and less over time and we're trying to get as much revenue to the creator as possible. And then, so in the ideal, maybe you have people in Brazil or in Venezuela or in the Philippines or in Cambodia who are able to produce that content 
and actually be able to make like meaningful revenue. You know, like I said, five thousand dollars a collection that can change their life. I think that's you know, I am much more interested in that world of wealth distribution than in the Axie Infinity. I'm a seed investor, by the way, in Sky Mavis, but I'm more interested in that, like creator to consumer connection and liquidity of the of the currency that they get mm-hmm. than in the play to earn kind of Ponzi nomic, play the game, get money to play the game kind of dynamic. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. And I'm wondering like how do you make money? Like is it like users buy this gold and they need to like with US dollars and they use this gold to buy items or like how does it work? That's right. So right now, so we did about 30 million in revenue last year as a company. And pretty much all of it came from virtual goods sales. So people buy our currency, they buy gold or they buy stars in Everskies, gold in high rise, and then they spend the gold in our world. There's lots of different ways to potentially spend it. You could buy clothing directly from us. You could buy clothing from other users where we take a 10 to 30% fee, Mm -hmm. depending on how you end up buying it. There's like lots of consumables. You can pay for voice chat. The reason why we charge for voice chat, by the way, is to prevent toxicity. There's lots of different like kind of consumable mechanisms by which you can spend gold. But in general, you buy gold from us. It's like you have a little wallet now with gold and then you spend it over time. And then when you run out of gold, you kind of buy some more. This will change with Web3. So as we integrate our new token, the way that we're, we're launching our token that we're calling the Rise token, the way that we're going to launch it, we're not doing any private sales. We're not doing any public sales. We're not selling the token at all because we don't want financial speculators involved in our token. We don't want them dumping on us in two years, right? Dumping on our community. And instead, the way that we're doing it is we're actually distributing the token through rewards and airdrops to our users. And then we're pairing it with utility. So we're going to be selling content, enabling the marketplace, et cetera. That's all going to be denominated in the Rise token. And so as we airdrop and reward the token to our users and they're able to spend it and they want to spend it, we will kind of enable an exchange. We're working with you know a Trader Joe or a Pangolin. These are exchanges on top of Avalanche where they can start to kind of exchange the tokens between each other in order to make those purchases, creating the market for the token. Mm -hmm. That's kind of our strategy. And if you think about it, that's a very different business model, right? We no longer sell the currency. We no longer sell the currency at all, which is our fundamental business model now. Instead, what we do Mm -hmm. is we give the currency. We actually have a lot of currency in reserve. So we we can kind of like sell the currency that's in reserve. Yeah. And... When people pay us, when they pay us for something, we actually collect that currency. But that currency is liquid and we could theoretically exchange it for US dollars or whatever. And so it's a bit of a different model than the kind of traditional gaming model where the currency is not liquid. Mm -hmm. But like, Anton, aren't you scared about this transition? I mean, like you have like $30 million revenue business and you are risking a lot. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe... I believe very strongly and emphatically that the next social networking, the next really large social networking platform is going to look like what we call today like a metaverse. And I very strongly believe that the underlying technology for that is going to be, at least for the economic part, is going to be composable permissionless money. I'm just, you know, I'm a believer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and I see it, you know, I, I see the value. And so, I mean, the way that we're actually introducing this transition is it's a bit smoother than you might think because we're not getting rid of gold. Gold is still the currency for the high rise 101 tower. Rise is almost like this meta currency across all of the different towers, mm-hmm. not just high rise 101, which is ours, but also maybe yours, if you, you know, or you know, whatever community ends up building. We're actually in a month or two, we're actually this week we're announcing that we're going to be launching our first partner. Our first partner is going to be Capsule House, which is a pretty popular NFT community. And so they're going to be actually our first third party high rise. And uh, the goal there is get the capsules rendered in high rise, give them their own world, which is capsulehouse.highrise.game. And then they can host their AMAs there. They can start to build experiences there and games there, all to kind of activate their community and the fandom around their community, right? So that's kind of what we're going to be doing there. And uh, all of that is is kind of part of the, the third party mm-hmm. high rise system. Our high rise still has our currency goal. Capsule House actually might have its own currency. Mm-hmm. It might introduce its own currency inside of their high rise. And then the top level currency or token is the Rise token. Yeah, so it's like Ethereum compared to like all the ERC20 tokens that you can... Exactly. And then we're still going to allow fiat purchasing. So if you want to buy gold with fiat, 
go for it. It's just that some things might only be denominated in the RISE token, or they might be discounted if you buy in the RISE token, things like that. You know, what are the biggest challenges that you have when you when you run this metaverse world? Like, what's the hardest thing about it? Well, maybe I can share kind of like our philosophy for how we build. So I, I think I love building and consumer and working on something creative because it's actually, in my mind, a very kind of creatively scientific process because it's extremely trial and error. So what we do is we we build MVPs, we roll out the MVPs, and we see how our audience and users react to those MVPs. You know, we have a hypothesis. Maybe we've talked to a, a user, a collection of users who have suggested something, or maybe it's just come from us. We have this idea, or maybe we see it in another product. But the point is that we take that information, we construct an MVP, we roll out the MVP, and then we collect data. Are, are people into it? Are they engaged? Are they using it? And we just rinse and repeat. We keep doing that over and over and over again. We make sure that we cut, right? So if features aren't engaging or they aren't working, we don't want the product to bloat. There's so many issues with that. One is user experience, but two is actually tech debt. You know, tech debt just continues to balloon, continues to grow, then you have to rewrite everything. And so the whole process of building is very trial and error. And so I think that the, the most challenging thing, maybe if I had to reflect, is, is the patience that kind of that requires because most things don't work. Mm -hmm. Most things actually have a kind of a trivial impact. And then some things have a huge impact. And uh, oftentimes, actually, you wouldn't predict mm -hmm. necessarily that something would happen. We, we just released something on Everskies that has had a huge impact on retention. Huge. I won't say what it is because it's a little, I guess, uh, competitive info, let's say. But it was shocking to us. Like We released the patch thinking that actually that patch would have no effect on any of our metrics. And yet, uh, retention increased by like 20% or something, wow. which is massive. Yeah, it's a massive, I mean, the, literally the, the, I think that is, but the point is that you just don't know. And so a lot of it is just trial and error, testing, 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 not being discouraged because eventually you'll find something. Mm -hmm. That's the way that I build. I almost, the analogy that I like to, to use is I'm like a, I'm an explorer. I'm like Magellan on mm -hmm. the high seas. I'm just navigating, trying to find the next island. And honestly, I, I think there's a lot of lore around visionary founders like this, this idea that Steve Jobs, you know, mm -hmm. thought of the iPhone in like 2005 and then released it in 2000 or whatever, 2000, released in 2009. And, and the reality is even Steve Jobs says this, he says the dots connect backwards. Yeah. They don't connect forwards, right? And it, even when you look at the story of the iPhone, they developed a touchscreen, that touchscreen was for something else entirely. And they're like, wait a second, this touchscreen is pretty cool. Maybe we can make a phone out of it. And then it really is a very much like a evolutionary process where the dots end up mm -hmm. connecting backwards. Not, I have a five-year vision and build this thing yeah. in the next five years. So yeah, hopefully that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you need to trust the process and it takes a lot of patience and a lot of faith, I guess, to, to really trust it. Yeah, trust yourself. Yeah, that you will eventually find something yeah and and to persevere not give up like i said we bootstrapped for the first five years and for the our first two products were failures and i think about two three years in for whatever reason we didn't give up you know and it's kind of interesting I, so i had a co-founder jimmy and we've worked on this together since 2013 i think part of it was just we we really liked working together and so we were like let's keep trying let's keep trying let's keep trying mm. even before those two products we worked on like a, a couple of dating apps just just kind of for fun to see how things go and i think um a lot of it is is having the right people on the journey with you because the process itself should be really fun kind of should mm. be exciting i mean it's stressful too and it's hard and especially when it's not working and you're not making it but nonetheless we just kind of kept trying kept trying kept trying and eventually we just found something that, that worked that still really resonated with us and resonated with what we do. Mm. And so a lot of it is perseverance, just kind of yeah. sticking with it. And you know, Anton, like as you're transitioning to the web free world very strongly, I'm wondering, is there like if you had a magic wand and you could fix one thing about web free, what would you fix? Yeah, I mean, we're really focused on the user experience. So I think this is a pretty common refrain, but I think because it's true. Yeah. It's like you really see the promise. You're like, look, I, I sent money over Ethereum to someone and it was beautiful, right? Like it was relatively cheap fees. It was quite a bit of money. They definitely got it, et cetera. But that's once you're really familiar with how to like use it. If you're just a new user, it's terrifying. Like I'm sending a lot of money. I'm sending it yeah. over MetaMask. It's like gone for 30 seconds or whatever. I don't know where it's going. Uh, you know, all the tooling yeah. is kind of janky and, and confusing. So I think it's so obviously great 
just in terms of like very simple things, like, like even just sending money. Again, I compare it to sending a wire mm -hmm. using my bank and it's just technologically superior, but the UX leaves something to desire, to be desired. And honestly, I mean, I, I do believe in this idea that blockchain itself, the thing that underpins it needs to be decentralized, but I'm not confident that all of the tooling around it needs to be decentralized. You know, if you have banking rails, if you have payment systems, I have no issues with, you know, a centralized bank existing on top of, you know, Ethereum rails so that when I send money to you, that money is actually insured. If it's sent to the wrong address, the centralized actor, the centralized bank can either maybe even reverse the transaction, but can at least insure the transaction. I'm actually comfortable with all of that as long as the underlying mm -hmm. architecture is decentralized. And so I think actually a lot of the UX problems will be solved as a lot of centralized tooling is built on top of this decentralized infrastructure. And I know that might be a little bit antithetical to how some people think mm -hmm. about it, but you know, they're like, not your keys, not your money, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I do think for it to get mass adoption, you need a lot of that UX and that security stuff to be solved. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets solved by a, a more centralized layer that sits on top of the decentralized layer. The one caveat to that I'll give is like Celsius, you know, where you have a centralized layer that is just doing nefarious things, They're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And once you have a centralized layer, they need to be regulated and so on yeah. and so forth. But ideally a centralized but transparent layer. That's probably not going to happen. So instead, you'll probably have a centralized and regulated layer. Yeah. And like, and then like you've watched blockchain space for the last almost 10 years. What have been the most mind blowing web free projects that you have seen so far? Something that, you know, intrigued you or just like was so creative, maybe it didn't make sense, like it wasn't useful, but it was so creative that, you know, got you hooked. Yeah. This one might be uh, a little obvious and cliche, but I, I thought Uniswap was like incredible when I saw it. Just to, I mean, it's so simple, this concept of an automated market maker, but it's so, so powerful to be able to basically, I don't know, democratize or whatever you might call it, market making. It's basically UGC for liquidity pairs. And to me, that's, that's incredible because once everything is liquid to everything else, because you have this UGC platform where anyone can provide liquidity, all of a sudden you don't really care what asset you hold because every asset is completely liquid. And so you're like, why would I hold dollars when I can hold this thing that is completely liquid to dollars as long as the volatility is similar? And then now I'm making, now the question that I'm making is like, do I hold this thing because I care about its volatility or what, you know, my kind of potential thinking about price appreciation. Mm -hmm. But the point is that it's completely liquid. I can always exchange it super easy to exchange. And platforms like Uniswap are incredible. When I first saw it, maybe I didn't really fully understand it, but then very quickly I was like, wow, this is, this is one of the most powerful tools that ever. And it can only exist because blockchain is composable and permissionless. Like all of the assets on it are composable and permissionless. And so, yeah, I thought that was like really impressive. I'm a seed investor in Sky Mavis. So I invested in Sky Mavis. They're the company that makes Axie Infinity and the Ronin sidechain uh, or blockchain. I invested in them before they moved Axie over to Ronin. And so they were very small. The good old times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> very small. They didn't, you know, Axie was not that popular. And I was blown away when they switched over to Ronin and the thing just turned on, right? It just, everyone wanted to get into Axie. Everyone wanted to buy an Axie. Everyone wanted to make SLP. And it was crazy to see. And then what I was really intrigued by and impressed by was the manager-scholar relationship. This idea that because you have NFTs that actually cost money and a lot of people can't afford them, but you know it's a way for people to get in and, and maybe make some like play to earn money. You know, People would rent out their Axies to scholars so I actually did that for a little while, just out of curiosity. I had three axes. I rented them out to some scholars. And it was crazy, first of all, the demand. So I posted in the Axie Infinity Discord. I said, you know, are there any scholars who want to play with my... And it, literally, I got like 500 messages in Discord in like five seconds. It was crazy, the demand. Obviously, none of this was sustainable. Obviously, it was all very like Ponzi-like. You know, it, it was all this idea of people coming in to buy the axes in order to get the SLP. And then eventually, you run out of users, all that mm -hmm. stuff. That's all very, very true. But nonetheless, the phenomenon was insane to watch because it was so big and so fast and so impressive. Mm. And by the way, you know, the guys over at Axie had no idea that it would blow up to be this big. You know, they were just doing something that they thought was interesting. So I, I thought that was a really cool project to see also. Yeah. And like, how would you fix Axie to make it more sustainable? 
if you can say it as an angel investor, I'm not sure. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think they're working on it, right? I, I but the reality is just you know a more engaging game that is fun for the game and not just for making SLP. Mm-hmm. I, I think the narrative just kind of got away from the product, and the narrative became all about earning, like earning mm-hmm. sustainable living, etc. But that's not what games are really about or meant to be about. And unless again, like there's creators on it and those, and, and the creators should be earning. Like there's a, a group of creators who are creating the games, you know, like on Roblox, like on High Rise, et cetera. But that's going to be a really, really small percentage of users mm-hmm. like by design. It's, it's not going to be everyone. And so I think the narrative just kind of got away from them. The game itself just needs to be like really engaging, really fun. And I will say like Axie is a, a good game, pretty good game, but you know, it's not $10 billion good. Like it, it's, you know, it's, it's not that level of scale. And when the narrative is all about play to earn, is all about making money, mm-hmm. then very quickly, once you stop making money, you stop playing. <laughs> yeah. And the whole network unwinds. They're working on continuing to improve the game yeah. and build it up and et cetera. And they still have a very passionate audience that, that they invented the, you know, the whole guild system that kind of was constructed around Axie. I think there's a lot of promise. It just blew up really fast because of the play to earn narrative. That unwinds fast. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I was thinking about this, you know, how to make games sustainable. Because I, I recall World of Warcraft, like, you know, 15 years ago, when it was like a hit. And I had a friend who was actually doing play to earn before it was mainstream because he was farming gold. He was in high school and, and sold this gold. Like, it was not legal to do it, but he found a guy that paid him. I don't remember how much, maybe, I don't know, like 10 bucks for some amount of gold. And the thing was that it was sustainable because for most people, $10 was worth less than having, like, a cool new sword or, like, having a great new horse or, like, whatever. So, like, I think, like, the if I had to make, like, a TLDR sustainability advice for games, it will be like, make it so cool that people don't want to sell in-game assets. And like, then it it can work. But otherwise, like... Yeah, I mean, I think there's a balance, right? You're distributing, basically, what is a game? A game is a set of rules. (laughs) Rules that are artificial, they're constructed by the game creator. And oftentimes those rules require a trade-off of time for value. So you spend a lot of time, you get some value. and what you saw in World of Warcraft, this is, I did this in Diablo 2 multiplayer, is you spend a lot of time, which gives you some kind of unit of value for that time, in this case, like a really nice sword or whatever it might be. And then you can go and sell it because it's a representation of how much time you spent. So it's like literally you spend all this time working on this thing and you sell it. Somebody pays you for that time to get the thing. And I, I think, you know, to some degree, Axie has that. It's just that it, it was disproportionately I would say all about getting people into the ecosystem mm-hmm. um, to buy up axes, and that's where all the revenue was coming from. But in the case of you know Diablo two multiplayer, World of Warcraft, RuneScape, all these games, it's like somebody wants that asset. The only way to get that asset is to spend time within this like world of rules, and then you can sell it. The alternative is I can go in and just ask the game developer and be like, hey, I want to buy this thing, <laughs> and then the game developer sells it to you, right? And that's more like you know pay to win. And for the game developer, I would say. It's a balance, right? How much can they grow their community by making many, many things that require lots of time so that the community has a marketplace where people are trading time for you know, value or assets? And how much of it is the developer is just like, yeah, just buy this thing from me because you could either spend a lot of time on it or you could just buy it from me, the developer. And I'll sell it to you for 10 bucks. And the developer actually makes pure profit on that. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they make all of the margin on that. Versus if they let like this working class develop, right? The working class develops and then they maybe take 10% of whatever the working class ends up doing. And the, the trade-off for the developer is thinking about how big will my network be if I have a massive working class, you know, who are kind of creating the content and then selling it to the people who are willing to buy it versus how much revenue will I make if I just kind of sell it directly. And I believe I'm, I'm much more excited about the idea of creating the consumer creator of economy and having like a large working class, things like that, for trading time for, for value that they give to the users. I think that you build a much bigger network that way. And I actually think that the value comes from the size of the network much more than the, you know, than, than the revenue necessarily that you could, you could earn. But I would say that's a lot of the math that developers have to do. 
Okay, thanks, Anton. Like, I have two last questions before we finish. Like, the first one is, who do you think might be a good fit for the conversation that we had? Someone who is a builder in the web free space and already have some traction so they can share their experiences? I mean, uh, I would say the folks at Immutable have done a really cool job because they have both built the blockchain working with Starknet and they have Gods Unchained and Gilded Guardians coming out. So they kind of like see both mm-hmm. both perspectives and working with like big game developers. So it'd be someone like a Robbie. I would say, uh, uh, I don't know if you know Mini Royale, but they're a game on Solana. They're a game on Solana that's, that's done quite well. And they're like a first person shooter that's web-based. Uh, where they sell a lot of the virtual goods on Solana. They've kind of been uh, not, not so under the radar, but they've, they've done a really good job of kind of building up their, their game, their product. Yeah, so, so maybe those two would be interesting. Yeah, I feel like Solana gaming is is growing very fast in the last few months. It does seem to be growing a, a lot. Of well, Stepin has been the big driver there. Yeah, I had Yon wrong, like the co-founder of Stepin on the podcast. Like, Okay, yeah. Yeah, because I was like an early adopter. Like, I really believed that they will transition from this Ponzinomics to a more sustainable model, but they haven't managed to do it so far. Unfortunately, I think it's really, really hard. Yeah. Especially when you grow so fast and you're so big. I mean, how do you create, you know, whatever they were, $10 billion worth of value in like six months through, I don't know, brand activations or advertising or however they were going to build a sustainable model? It's impossibly hard, in my opinion. Yeah. It's super hard. And, you know, you know, I've been making like at the high point, I've been making like $500 a day by walking. Now I, Earn like I don't know, like maybe ten dollars a day yeah. by walking, but I still walk. <laughs> I still walk every day. So like it worked. It worked yeah. At some point it worked. Yeah. So because I got into this habit for so long that I just cannot just stop walking. So like that's really cool. Okay. So like Anton, like the last question: Where people can learn more about uh, your projects? Where should they go? Is it like Twitter, Discord, website? Okay. So there's a few. So our company website is PocketWorlds.com. Then we have High Rise, which is at highrise.game. And we have Everskies, which is at everskies.com. On Twitter, uh, we're Pocket Worlds, High Rise app, and Everskies. I'm personally on Twitter as Anton Burr, manton.e mm-hmm. is, the, is, my, <laughs> is my name. And then, yeah, reach out to me on any platform, Anton Bernstein, LinkedIn works too, whatever. There's kind of two asks I have. One is we're recruiting. I know a lot in the bear market, a lot of places are kind of clamping down and saying we're not recruiting anymore. Uh, we're profitable. We're growing quickly. And we really need kind of more hands to accomplish our mission of building the high rise world and enabling lots of different communities to be built out of our high rises. That's one. And then two is if there's any projects that are building that are interested in launching their own high rise, say they already have a community or they already have some sort of brand or IP where they want to have their own virtual space or virtual world or metaverse, I would love to talk to them and bring them on and help them set up their high rise. It's a place where, you know, say you have a Reddit, say you have a Discord. These are all social communities that drive engagement, but you can't make money on them, right? There's no revenue model. Here, we're offering you a place where you can engage your community and interact with them. Then there's also on top of that, a revenue model where you can sell content, sell virtual goods and activate your fandom to do the same. And as we launch our token, which we're going to launch in about two, three months or so, we're going to have an ecosystem development fund where we're going to use our token to incentivize people to build their high rises and build content in high rise. So yeah, please reach out. I'd love to talk to you about that. Okay, perfect. So thanks a lot, Anton. And I, well, finally, I can say it. See you in the metaverse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>